So here we are. We're actually in Thompson, Connecticut. Actually, I need to stop for a second. I've done this trail several times. And I don't know if you could tell, basically ear level to me, that guy has a pond. I've never noticed it before. And I'm not sure he had it before. We've had a ton of torrential downpours lately and uh, that might be a result of it. Anyway, we are in Thompson, Connecticut and we're heading to the Tri-State Marker. There's several ways to get to it. Um, this is the way I chose today. Um, it's gonna be where Connecticut meets with Rhode Island in Burville, which is actually my hometown. And it also meets with Massachusetts in Douglas, which is well, pretty close to us. Obviously we're on the trail. <laughs> um, this is an old railroad trail right here that turned into a walking trail and it's pretty heavily used. Uh, we're gonna be hitting a loop off of this to get to the Tri-State Marker. Um, so this trail is the SNET Trail, the Southern New England Trunk Line Trail. Uh, and just behind me over there, you see that building directly ahead? That is actually, is actually across the street from where we just were, or where we are, excuse me. And uh, that's where it turns into the airline trail. And I'm not sure where that goes, because other than parking over there compared to here, I have absolutely no idea where that goes. Anyway, we're already on the trail, so we're going to be talking about the three-prong attack and the occupation of Philadelphia. And here we go. Again, we're on the SNET trail, which literally crosses across my road, uh, but not on the Rhode Island side. It crosses on the Massachusetts side. And uh, it's actually 21 miles long and goes all the way to Franklin, Mass. Um, so here we go. This trail's pretty nice. You can see the first structure we're gonna come across. This looks a lot better in the summertime with the lush green. Uh, it's almost glowing and worth seeing but we can see it now too we'll we'll take a little climb up and walk on it a little bit uh, we won't go on the left side that is private property and it's very well marked although i don't see it yet um the right side is where we'll enter all right so let's talk about the occupation of philadelphia did you know that the British occupied Philadelphia in 1777? Oh, there's no trespassing signs. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll know about it after this. But it's a deep and fascinating story that changed the whole war. There we go. Let's go underneath it like this. <laughs> so the year 1777, we're basically sitting at a, at a stalemate. The, the British are occupying Manhattan uh, after basically giving us a, a good old whooping in 1776. Um, the British have started to put together a battle plan that they would hope would put an end to this war right then and there. And the plan that they came up with was what's called a three-prong, or what they called a three-prong attack, to actually capture the Hudson River. Their thoughts are, if they captured the Hudson River, they would separate the New England colonies with the rest of the colonies. <coughs> Excuse me. Which seems believable. I do believe personally that if they did actually capture the Hudson River, then we would be done. So the plan was to have three people. And, and with this, let's start talking about some of the characters. And we'll, we'll start with the British themselves. You have British General Howe. And General Howe is the commander in chief of all British forces in North America. He has there we go, three direct subordinates of General Cornwallis, whose name you'll hear a lot towards the end of the war. Um, him and General Green going at it a little bit at the end. And uh, let's not forget, he's the commanding general at Yorktown. And you also have British General Clinton and General Burgoyne, also British general. 
Um, and not necessarily one of his subordinates at this point, but Colonel St. Leger, British Colonel St. Leger, plays a big role in this. Now, Burgoyne, who's in Quebec, is the one that devised this plan. And the plan was for him to march down the Hudson River towards Albany with 6,000 troops. Um, then Colonel St. Leger is going to go through Lake Erie and start making his way east after going so far west um, towards Albany as well. Um, actually, the path that St. Leger was taking is very close and similar to what is known as excuse me, the Erie Canal. Um, while General Howe was to march, or excuse me, sail up with his brother, Admiral Howe, um, and also to meet in Albany. Albany is almost that center point, but that's where you start hitting much more civilization compared to the northern parts of the Hudson River. There we go. It's a nice pond down here. Or more of a wetland. It's a decent drop down there too. I always like this, but I've never climbed down it. Not sure I'd be able to take my kayak down there to fish that. But maybe my fishing pole, which is in my car. Um, anyway, moving on. <laughs> So, with that set in motion, things had changed. General Howe had written to Parliament uh, suggesting a new plan of occupying Philadelphia. And having, let's say, two to four months roughly to get any communication on a round trip to him back and forth uh, means communication was not very good. So when Parliament had approved the plans for Philadelphia, the word had not gotten to either St. Leger or to Burgoyne until it was too late. They had already started their treks. Um, so before we go into Burgoyne and St. Leger, let's talk about what General Howe actually did. He had actually, he crossed over to Sandy Point New Jersey from Manhattan, uh, set up a fort there, and basically used that as a harbor for landing. Um, he stayed in that area for a while, um, but left several different times and went into the Chesapeake Bay. And what he was trying to do was basically keep General Washington on his toes. Uh, Washington was only guessing, well, where is he going? Why is he going into the Chesapeake Bay? What's going on? Um, finally, the third time that he had actually gone into the Chesapeake Bay, he was heading somewhere, and he went virtually undetected. He, uh, he landed in what was called Head of Elk, Maryland. Uh, if you look it up nowadays, it's called Elkton, Maryland. Um, but he landed there and started cutting out a path to head straight towards Philadelphia. It's 40 to 50 miles-ish, roughly, for that. Um, so as he made his trek, he did fight several small skirmishes. Um, a notable one would be Cooch's Bridge, which was in Glasgow, Newark, Delaware. Kind of rides both lines right there. Um, here, so here we are at the beginning of the trail for the North-South Trail. I'm um, not sure you can see it quite yet, but ahead forward is where we'll be coming out. So it is a loop coming this way. And then trail, it says right there. Um, so once he was out of Cooch's Bridge, he's, he did actually make it into Pennsylvania at that point. That was the, the only battle in the Revolutionary War that happened in Delaware, by the way. Um, but once, once he was there, Washington found a spot that would be a great place to, you know, try to stop him again. And I'm talking about Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, at the Brandywine River. And now, um, oddly enough, on September 11th, we're about to have a battle. 
And in this battle, actually, we have uh, General Lafayette making his appearance. This is his first battle. Um, Lafayette was actually wounded in the battle, uh, but still, with General Greene's help, able to cover the retreat for the army uh, because, unfortunately, the retreat was necessary and needed. Um, so there was one more stand, um, and it was just outside of Philadelphia called Germantown. And, uh, that was a, a very, very large disaster. Um, Colonel Henry Knox had found himself in a very rough situation that got out of hand really fast. So... Obviously, that didn't work out too well for the Continental Army. And after that, Howe went unopposed from that point forward right into Philadelphia. But long before that had happened, Congress had already fled Philadelphia anyway. Uh, they went over to, to Yorktown. And I'm not speaking about Yorktown, Virginia, where that battle took place. I'm talking about Yorktown, Pennsylvania. Um, which is better known as York, Pennsylvania today. So he went there and he set up his winter quarters. And what General Washington did was roughly about 20 miles away, he set up his encampment at Valley Forge. And he had a good vantage spot to see any move that Howe would have made at that point forward. Um, a lot happened at Valley Forge, and uh, the biggest story to come out of there was we have an army. Um, General von Steuben, you know, Baron von Steuben, you could say, from the Prussian army, um, was introduced at Valley Forge, and he actually turned our men into soldiers. And from after Valley Forge, we walked out with an army. Um, but we won't talk about that quite yet. We gotta save that for the end. Now that we know what happened with Washington and Howe, we can discuss what happened on the Hudson River. And we'll start with Saint, excuse me, yeah, Colonel Saint Leger. So Saint Leger had made his way, you know, down what would be the Erie Canal, and he made it to a place called Rome, New York. And in Rome, New York, there's a fort called Fort Stanwix. And waiting at Fort Stanwix was Benedict Arnold, newly General Benedict Arnold. Uh, he's only a Brigadier General at this point, but that doesn't last long before he moves up to Major General. Um, there was a battle that took place. St. Leger basically had no chance there. Uh, Arnold knew that he was coming and was well prepared for anything basically St. Leger, Leger could have thrown at him. So after that battle, St. Leger is ordered to turn around, head back to the, uh, Lake Erie, and then over to Quebec again. So basically do a complete turnaround reverse of what he had just done after getting beaten so badly. After that, Benedict Arnold headed straight towards Saratoga to meet with General Gates. Now, Saratoga is just north of Albany, and if you're driving, it's roughly about 40 minutes. Um, Saratoga is where both Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates actually start setting the battle plans. Now, Benedict Arnold is a subordinate, as Gates is the superior officer for sure, um, at least in rank. And as they're setting up the battle plans, they're, they're not on the same page. They're definitely not in agreement to which way the battle should go. Gates is more concerned with taking a defensive approach and letting the British come to him. Which seems like a bad idea, since we don't have really a way to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British yet. Um... Arnold, on the other hand, wants a complete different approach. Arnold wants to go on the attack and hit them where they're being, where they're not being expected, basically. 
could have probably said that better, but there you go. Um, the exchange between Gates and Arnold gets so heated that Gates banishes Arnold to his tent for the battle. Now, let me, let me back up here a little bit, got a little ahead of myself. There were two battles there. There was Freeman's Farm and there was um, Bemis Heights. Be Bemis Heights being the latter and the one that we're going to more focus on. So Burgoyne comes down. This is where we really got ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Burgoyne's coming down and he did not expect what he saw there. Uh, what I mean is he thought there were going to be roads to travel. He thought it was going to be an easy trek. So much so that he had actually put he brought all his personal belongings with him, all of it, in, in uh, several wagons just for him. Uh, turns out it's wilderness land and the mosquitoes there are much, much worse than he had ever expected. It was a horrible trek for his army. Whew, getting out of breath, we're going uphill for sure. Um, he finally made it to Saratoga. Well. Let me back up a little bit. <laughs> Getting way ahead of myself. <laughs> so on his way down, he stopped at Fort Ticonderoga, which is under continental control since Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold took it in, in 1775. But just as easy as it was for us to capture it, it was just as easy for them to capture it as well. They had actually, uh, Burgoyne had sent some artillery up to Mount Defiance, which is a high point across from Ticonderoga. <laughs> Nobody ever had expected anybody would be able to make it up there, let alone fortify it. So that happened and basically everybody <laughs> evacuated the fort. Um, Burgoyne, sent a foraging party out who went into Vermont, into Bennington, Vermont. And another battle takes place there. We're gonna take a little rest here. I'm way out of breath. But while we stop here, at the top of that hill in front of us, that's the North, uh, the Tri-State Marker up there. In fact, I can see it. I'm sure the camera can. This way is where you actually have the real start of the uh, Tri-State Marker going downhill there. But that is also the same spot that the Rhode Island North South, South Trail starts as the Mid-State Trail here in Mass stops. Whew. Okay. Got my breath, kinda. <laughs> All right, where were we? Right, so Bennington, Vermont. Um, militia unit, uh, units met up with the foraging party and a battle took place. And the foraging party was beat up pretty good and was forced to retreat back to Burgoyne. Uh, that was completely unexpected. And that's when Burgoyne started making his march towards Albany again, only to be stopped in Saratoga. And now, since I was ahead of myself, we're caught back up again. When Burgoyne, so after Freeman's Farms battle took place, which was a draw, it was basically both of them saying, all right, let's take a break. And then Bemis Heights was roughly about two weeks later, um, after they were just basically Oh, still catching back up. When Bemis Heights took place, that was where Colonel Arnold, excuse me, General Arnold was banished to his tent. And the battle starts to happen. And the British had basically prepared themselves a lot better than Gates had prepared himself. And uh, Gates' defensive approach towards the battle turned out being a horrible idea 
Luckily, Benedict Arnold heard everything going on and I, I, I love that I get to say this because it's true. He jumped on his white horse and went and saved the day. Um, so he had actually re rallied the troops to start an attack again and proved to be successful. He, he got Daniel Morgan, another character you actually hear throughout the Revolutionary War for good reasons, and his riflemen. They didn't have muskets, they had actually rifled barrels, so they were more accurate. Um, and he ordered them to shoot down the British officers. Um, Fraser being the most notable name there, who was shot down on the British. But the uh, that was and is the beginning of the term sniper. Let's see where the Tri-State Trail goes this way now. I've actually never taken it there either. It looks pretty nice and whoa this rock is split cool oh there you go so now we'll, we'll pause for a second i'm standing in rhode island as you can see and now we're standing in connecticut as you can see and now we're in mass pretty cool huh in three states at once just put your hand right up here I brought the camera with me but I'm not taking any pictures so I was planning on it it's also planning on breaking up this video some so after that with with the shooting of Frazier the the British troops began to be disorganized completely um, you have no superior officers telling you what to do it's a guesswork on what you're going to do along with everybody else around you is doing the same thing. So Burgoyne was forced to surrender. And this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. Not only because, you know, there's 6,000 less troops that the British have to fight us now. Um, but the repercussions of this battle were felt to the end of the war. This is known as the turning point of the war. And why do I say that? Well, almost every historian you'll, about the Revolutionary War will tell you the same thing. And it has everything to do with the British. Now see, Benjamin Franklin, he is in France. He's been there almost the whole war. And his main purpose there is he's begging and pleading for more money, troops, supplies, anything to help the war effort. And, and don't get me wrong, the, the, the French are helping. They're just not really putting it up enough to, to move us to the next level. Until the Battle of Saratoga, which is known as the Battle of Saratoga, even though that particular one was Bemis Heights and the other one was Freeman's Farm. Um, after Saratoga, the French's idea now is, oh, wait a second. These Americans can actually do something for themselves. So maybe we should help them out. And with that said, they had declared war on the British, finally. So they were all in. It is now a world war at this point. Um, because with the French, um, through marriage, uh, royal marriages, here comes the Spanish as well. And uh, turns out that was actually the, the main reason why the French weren't pushing too much to help because they were still trying to secure that deal. Um, so the French are in, they come and help. And now that I'm back in Mass and not in Rhode Island over there anymore, um, the very first battle that the French are going to help is the Battle of Rhode Island. Um, which was New England's largest battle during the Revolutionary War. Um, really rocky on this side. Could have, should have went up this way and taken the steps. Um, <laughs> uh, we won't really get into the Battle of Rhode Island because it's not really directly connected to this. Um, but it's worth talking about at some point. Most people, even in Rhode Island, have absolutely no idea that the Battle of Rhode Island existed. So here we are. We'll talk about it at some point. <laughs> now, 
the, the, the French helping was a very, very rocky start, including the Battle of Rhode Island. Uh, there is a term I'll talk about that comes out of that, and that is or excuse, the expression of sullied your good name. Uh, that expression actually came from that battle, um, talking about General John Sullivan, Continental General. Uh, he's one of the big names. With Green, he was one of the original War Council members. Uh, he actually even led his own line at the Battle of Trenton, so he was, he was a man to be celebrated, but messed up there. <laughs> I'll at least tell you what he did. I can't leave you hanging on that part. Um, so, after the battle, the, the Admiral d'Estaing, uh, the Comte d'Estaing for the French, uh, didn't actually attend the battle. Um, while well, Sullivan still did. And, and reasons behind that is a big storm, hurricane if you may, it came across and it actually damaged and destroyed a lot of his fleet. So much so that he was not in any condition to actually battle. Uh, knowing this, other than sailing up uh, Oquidnick Island, which is basically Newport, Rhode Island, um, he went around Cape Cod and went into Boston to go get his fleet repaired. He couldn't go to Newport and do it because uh, Newport was, has been occupied since the beginning by the British. So <laughs> the battle happens and it basically, I like to personally call it a draw. And we can leave it at that. But after the battle is where John Sullivan did not have a lot of nice things to say about the Admiral. Uh, and he made sure that everybody heard this except for the Admiral. He didn't go to the Admiral and confront him personally. Uh, so the Admiral caught wind of this and obviously he's upset about it. He even says, you know, I, I was just down in the West Indies. That's where I want to be. If this is how I'm going to be treated, that's where I'm going to go. Uh, and he was serious, so he started packing up and heading his way. Now, Washington had to come step in, realizing how bad of a move that this was. Um, wanted to come and talk things over personally. He grabbed uh, General Lafayette to, as a translator, and went to the Admiral and, and smoothed things out. So. There's several turning points stemming from this um, and a lot of roadblocks trying to get in the way. Um, the turning point is Saratoga bringing the French in to help, uh, but then when the French threatened to leave, Washington stepping in to smooth things back out was also a turning point. And uh, most historians, including myself, will tell you this because without the French's help in the American Revolution, we had no chance, none. We were done. I mean, we were hanging by a thread since 1776. So, you know, that's a keeping the British, uh, excuse me, keeping the French happy is very, very important. So John Sullivan himself uh, gets sent, you know, to Western New York. What is he doing in Western New York? Well, he is now in command of Fort Stanwix. And that's where Benedict Arnold uh, met up with Colonel St. Lajar. Legere, excuse me. Uh, so, unfortunately, John Sullivan, a great, great general, had a, a few moments of... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? <laughs> a few moments lapses, uh, common sense, and you just don't hear his name anymore after that. But his contributions, until that point, are important to remember. I will say that. All right, so now let's get back. How is in Philadelphia? And obviously it's winter encampment at this point. And in Philadelphia, they are not, they're having big parties. Uh, so once we get into the spring of 78 of nothing but parties for the British, Howe decides to leave Philadelphia. And Benedict Arnold comes right behind him and takes over the city as the military governor. How are you guys doing? 
I am recording, I apologize. <laughs> Talking about the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> you too, thanks. All right, where were we? Right, so Benedict Arnold moves into Philadelphia as a military governor. Um, a lot of things change after that, but that is not a story for now. Um, so, Howe is heading straight back to Sandy Hook, the, the fort that was a harbor that he had actually set up. And when he gets there, or excuse me, on his way there, he finds Washington and his new army that was trained to actually be a formidable army met up with him. He met up with him in a place called Monmouth, New Jersey. It's not far from Sandy Hook, so Howe almost made it. Uh, the battle ensues, um, and completely unexpected, Howe does not realize that they have an army that's trained and ready to go now. Oh, there's the end of the trail. Oh, so we're in Connecticut and Mass, I think, right here. Um, let's see. I don't know how I walked right past this. Probably because I was looking down at the rocks. So this is from 1906, the other was 1888. So yeah, we're in Mass here, and Connecticut here. So here we are, we're in both again. Looks like there was something supposed to go in there, but there's nothing in there. Um, all right, moving on. So the, the battle takes place, and there's really two battles that this happened during the Revolutionary War. Um, the other one actually being Brandywine, so before the occupation and just after the occupation. And what I'm talking about is there were more deaths in this battle from the weather than there were from, you know, dur during the actual battle itself. Uh, we're fighting in over a hundred degree temperatures, both battles, and people are dropping like flies because they don't dress like we do now. Uh, cotton is not really... Um, Part of their uniform you have more wool or linen which retain heat very well unfortunately for that battle uh, but the results of that battle with uh green was there general green was there with henry knox on the artillery they were together um the results was a draw um if you don't know this um washington was three four and one for his record of battles. So he won three, lost four, and had one draw. Uh, not a great record, but it worked. Uh, <laughs> so there was a draw there, and ultimately, at the end, Howe continued on his way to where he was originally going anyway, um, to back to Manhattan. Um, so the Battle of Monmouth was the last major engagement in the war in the north. So things started to move down south at that point, um, to where we've had a couple generals come and go there. Um, we had General Lincoln, who found himself in a tough spot, um, who was replaced by General Gates, who I still can't figure out what he was doing there. It doesn't make any sense. Of course, you know, reading the books and seeing the hindsight mean a lot different than actually being there. So. I'll give credit where credit's due on that one. Uh, moving along right there. So at the Battle of Camden is where Gates had lost. Um, and when Gates lost, he, he, he jumped on his horse and took off. He was so afraid that he couldn't stay out there any longer. It was a scary moment for him. Um, legend is, and I kind of believe it, that he rode his horse until it died and then grabbed another horse and did the same thing over again with the next horse and was well over 100 miles away the next morning without his men so that stemmed from that the, the replacement now um, congress had finally given general washington his choice on who he wants to take command of the southern campaign uh, until then, both Lincoln and Gates were chosen by Congress. Um, Washington quickly wrote to Green, and I don't know if you can see the quotes, it is my choice to choose you to go down there. Um, so Green went and took over the Southern Campaign and, and implemented a new strategy down there um, that ultimately forced Cornwallis with no other choice but to go to Yorktown uh, to which the, the unofficial ending of the war happened in Yorktown with another 
uh, 6,000 troop surrender, this time by Cornwallis. Uh, although Green was not there, Green went right back down south to regain all of these cities down there. So there's General Howe and the Battle of Saratoga in the occupation of Philadelphia as well. Oh, I left out a big point. So while General Howe did not sail up to Al Albany as planned, he did send General Clinton up. Um, and right around Highlands, where you see West Point, um, and you also have uh, Fort Montgomery and Fort Clinton. When I say Fort Clinton, I mean American General Clinton, not British General Clinton, who happens to uh, show up there. <laughs> um, they show up there, and they're greeted, uh, not so politely, I guess you could say. So there is a battle that takes place there, and it's success for the Continentals or the Americans. Um, not as in they won the battle, because they didn't. Uh, but what they did there was slow General Clinton down enough to where he couldn't make it to Burgoyne in time. Um, I can't believe I left out that very key moment uh, about there, because, <laughs> you know, it's pretty important, I'd say. Um, but other than that, there's your battle. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day.